is your first time here, that's very exciting. We're glad to have you. I didn't write that all down, that's important. Um, but uh, basically, this is a meetup about uh, discussing computer science and mathematics, and uh, specifically excited about the, the places where the two meet, so in the intersections between computer science and mathematics. Really, they're the same thing, and depending on whether you're a constructivist or a non constructivist, they may be exactly the same thing, or maybe uh, completely on different foundations. Anyways, um, I digress. So first, I want to say some thanks. Oh, hi, Eric. I want to say some thanks. Number one thanks is to Boltmate, who houses in this space. Thank you, Boltmate. Thank you, Boltmate. Um, a couple of reminders. One is that we do have a code on there. And we have this so that we can have a nice, safe, encouraging environment. Um, so I encourage you to read it all. And, 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 but also, just one quick reminder on that is that we try Sometimes the topics we discuss are complex, or we have all varying backgrounds, so we really want you to feel that you can uh, ask any question. I know it's really hard and people feel shy. So I might ask some of the dumb questions to lower the barrier, but also if you feel the urge to correct somebody's response, try to avoid saying, well, actually, and uh, try to avoid correcting someone else's response. And uh, if you really feel the need, try to phrase it in a uh, very empowering and manner. Nobody likes to be told that they're wrong even when they're answering a the question. I will also be wrong on answering people's questions, so feel free. Do not do that to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll feel bad. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have two speakers today. Uh, Christopher Ola, who's we have Matt Masuida, who is a durian enthusiast. <laughs> Once brought a durian to one of our talks. I'll never bring a durian again. <laughs> and, uh, he's a postdoc at U Waterloo and a Banach algebraist. Uh, yeah, so thanks everyone. So, uh, Chris will start. Take it So, uh, next speaker is a bow tieless uh, <laughs> Dr. Mazuida, all sorts of tieless. Uh, and uh, he will be talking about the excellent choice. Oh, perfect, perfect timing. Welcome back. Matt, would you like to come like Sure, why not? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's, it's an honor to speak after Chris. My talk is not nearly as snazzy as that. But I, have, I do have one image. It's not an animation, but it is an image. It's a very misleading image, and I'll explain why that is. In a uh, this talk is based on a similar talk, very similar talk, I gave in December in the same forum. Uh, and that was a very bitterly cool, and there was a fearsome storm that night, so there was a very small audience, of which I think everyone is here. So I apologize for those people who have basically seen this talk already. Yeah, it's good times. Uh, this is very much a pure mathematics talk, but I've tried to avoid all the technicalities I can. Uh, I think I can do a good gentle job of introducing what would be explaining the action of choice, but the reason it's controversial is because of its applications, and I'm, I won't be able to explain all the applications probably to everybody's satisfaction, because I know not everybody here has a very strong math background. So uh, before we begin, um, can I take a poll? Who has, has at least heard of the axiom of choice? Oh, everybody. Who, who could tell me what the axiom of choice is? Uh, all right, a smaller subset, but that's fine. Only because of your previous talk. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, even after that, it's uh, like, yeah, I'm not going to I'm trying. Well, there's too many yeah, well, options. Okay, well, <laughs> for the second time around, we'll really hammer it on. Uh, so I, this subtitle is not my own. Uh, I couldn't find a source for this quote, but I've heard this before. And the axiom of choice, not so called, because it's preferable to the other axioms. In some sense, it's actually the least preferable of all of them. I consider subtitling this talk a defense of constructive mathematics, because if you were here at the last meeting, you saw an excellent talk by Russell O'Connor in Dependent Type Theory, which he proposes as a harmonious marriage of logic, programming, and mathematics. But unfortunately, you lose non-constructive non -constructive techniques, of which the axiom of choice is kind of the king. It's almost, in some sense, the only one, actually. The only other non-constructive technique is subsumed with the axiom of choice, which we'll see at the end of the talk. So let us begin. You'll notice there are only 18 slides, and three of them are title pages, so there's not too many slides, but we can spend as much time talking between them as we like. And I can expound on some of the more technical concepts to the taste of the audience, if there's any demand. Okay, so to begin, uh, most of the talk actually is part one, uh, the history of the axiom and the foundation of mathematics. So if nothing else, I'd like people to take from this talk that there was at least once, and I'm sure there will be again one day, significant controversies in the foundations of mathematics. People think of it as this monolithic thing. You know, you go to high school, there's a correct way to do things, there's a correct answer, nobody disagrees, there are no discussions in mathematics lectures, but there's actually quite a bit of room for discussion, mostly at the level of foundations. So, uh, mathematics, uh, modern mainstream mathematics is, is written in the language of sets. 
And this was the first abstract definition of set I could find from Bolzano in 1847. Before this, people would talk about arbitrary sets of numbers, but this was the very first totally abstract definition of set I could find. It's a whole whose basic conception renders the arrangement of its parts a matter of indifference, and whose rearrangement therefore changes nothing essential from our point of view if only that changes I call a set. So this is written in kind of flowery language, but all he means is this collection of objects. The order that you present those objects is unimportant, right? So if I have ABC, that's the same as BAC, is the same as ACB. It's just a collection of things, so it's not a list, right? Uh, there's, I'm sure there's a programming name for this. I think you probably set. did call it set. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, because sets are also deduplicated. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. We, don't, we don't have duplicate, we don't have repeated entries. I don't know if you're, you allow these computers. Right, but he doesn't say anything about repeated entries. He doesn't, but he takes it for granted that you don't have repeated In that case, they call them banks. Yeah, yeah banks. So yes, a set is a number of collection of objects, and in modern mathematics, everything is a set. So functions are sets, numbers are sets. If you're into alternate foundations, you might disagree with this. I was hoping Russell would be here. He would have a really interesting argument during the talk. But uh, as far as modern working mainstream mathematicians are, con are concerned, at the end of the day, everything is a set. So, uh, the first person to really rigorously study sets in the abstract, you know, not sets of numbers, is this guy, Georg Cantor, I don't know how to pronounce that name, actually, in 1874, just to permute the last two numbers of the year there. So he was interested in abstract sets and these different sizes of infinity. I gave a talk last year on uh, these different sizes of infinities, we call them cardinalities, they're sizes of sets. And the example I want to introduce now, because we're going to come back to it, is that the real numbers, which is what mathematicians call the decimal numbers, these are a strictly bigger size of infinity than the natural numbers, which are just the positive counting numbers. So uh, I, if anybody is, if I've lost anybody already, it's not a big deal. We're going to come back to this example a little bit. I'm more than happy to expand on this further if we like at the end of the time. Privately, if that's the So. Uh, before we get to the axiom of choice, we're going to take a small detour through this well-ordering problem. So we call the set well-ordered if we have an order defined on it, and this is an order in a kind of naive sense. So some, you say something is less than or comes before something else. And it's a well-order if every non-empty subset has a least element. So for example, this angle bracket thing, just the normal less than, well-ordered is the natural numbers, this blackboard or n, but not the integers. Because if I look at all of the integers, there's no least element there, right? You can come up with more clever well orders, different orders than less than, but on the natural numbers, this works perfectly well. And a nice property of well ordered sets is they have successor functions. So to every element, I can say that there is a next element. And these next elements almost exhaust the set. And every element will have one of these next element successors, except you might have like a greatest element in your set. So you could take the counting numbers and just throw in an infinity. If you declare that this infinity is bigger than every counting number, then this infinity itself has no successor. It's the biggest thing you have. And it itself is not the successor of something else. Because you know, like, the successor of a natural number is just the next natural number. It's that number plus one. So you won't exhaust your collection of things only by doing the successor thing. You might have to take some sort of supreme operation. And in the infinity case, you'd say, well, the supremum of all the natural numbers is this infinity. I'm saying this infinity is the next biggest thing after you've exhausted all of the numbers. Anyway, so uh, people were trying to do this. This was a really important problem way back in the day, the late 19th century. Cantor himself wrote in 1883 that every set can be well ordered. He just declared this. He said that it was a valid law of thought. But uh, perhaps not surprisingly, not everybody was convinced by this. For example, like, if I give you the decimal numbers, how do you well order the decimal numbers? What is the next decimal number after root 2, or pi, or e? You know, there's no obvious candy, right? And Cantor was just claiming, oh, yeah, no problem, you just do it, it's fine. <laughs> so not everybody was convinced by this. So he tried very hard to prove it, and a couple times he thought he had a proof, but people always found mistakes. So we'll take a slight break from this problem. And then, a, so a few years later, in 1901, Bertrand Russell came up with this very famous paradox in mathematics, although it was actually known to this guy, Ernst Zermelo, who was the Z in ZFC. We'll see his name a whole bunch in this talk. He, he came up with this, this paradox, which comes from this very innocent question. Consider the set of all sets which don't contain themselves. Does this set contain itself? Um, I don't know, any, any, any ideas? The, 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 this is... Yes, no. Uh, oh. Yeah, yes, no, yeah. neither. It can't, well, <laughs> this is exactly the barber of Seville if uh, you're more familiar you know, with this um, question. You have to throw an exception, really. Well, yeah, you, you want to throw an exception, right? Yeah. Uh, if, if you assume that it does, you get a contradiction. You assume that it doesn't, you also get a contradiction. So it seems like there's no answer. So it's, it's entirely equivalent to this Barber of Seville question. 
He says, uh, you know, the barber of Seville, he shaves everybody in town who doesn't shave himself, but then who shaves the barber? You know, if he does shave himself, then as the barber, he's not supposed to shave him. And if he doesn't shave himself, then the barber has to shave him, but he is the barber, so he should shave himself. So either case leads to a contradiction. And this seems like some you know, silly curiosity that we wouldn't care about, but this was a huge crisis in the foundations of mathematics. Because all of a sudden, you know, th there was a contradiction within, this is really the heart of mathematics, these sets. And the business was a huge disaster. Yeah, yeah. and it was the, um, because they, ori they originally believed that a set could be defined uh, by a proposition, you know, yeah, a set yeah, exactly. that so contains like all x that, you know, and in some English set. So. So today we call this naive set theory. We just say like, oh yeah, I have a set of all things that satisfy some property, whatever that property is. Unfortunately, if you take this property, that it does not contain itself, you get this contradiction. So the solution to this, well, there were a few solutions. Russell's solutions was type theory, which we heard about last month. Uh, oh, yes, right. So, the so Russell's solution was type theory, and he spent you know, hundreds of pages in this book, Principia Mathematica, with Whitehead, proving that you know, 1 plus 1 equal to 2. I think it took like 400 pages in his type theory. A different solution was proposed by this Francis Zermelo guy uh, in 1908, and then it was revised with another guy named Frankel in the 1920s, and now this is known as Zermelo Frankel set theory, or ZF. Uh, and then with the axiom of choice added, this is the dominant foundation of mathematics that working mathematicians use today. So most of these axioms are very, they're pretty straightforward. They're things that we think of as fundamental. They say things like, if I have one set, and I have another set, and there's a third set that's just those two sets put together. I call it the union of those two sets. They're mostly fairly innocent things that you wouldn't really dispute. The, the funny one, uh, before we get to choice, is maybe the axiom of infinity, which asserts the existence of an infinite set. You don't get this for free. You have to assume it. And maybe this is really what people should, uh, should be disputing. I'll come back to this comment later. So, uh, Cantor wanted to show that there is no infinity strictly between this, the infinity of counting numbers and the infinity of real numbers. Uh, this statement is called the Gattino Hypothesis, and it was number one in Hilbert's list of 20 questions at the International Congress of Mathematicians in Paris in 1900. Hilbert was probably the best mathematician of his day. I don't think too many people would disagree with this. This was the very first problem on his list of the 20 most important problems for mathematicians in the new, in the new 20th century. And he remarks that he thinks that the well ordering problem is the key to solving this continuum hypothesis. And then along comes this guy, Frankel, and he proves that every set can be well ordered using this new axiom that he calls the axiom of choice. So the axiom of choice says that if I have a collection of non empty sets, then I can find a function that takes a value in each of those things. So it's, it's, we call this a choice function, because it's just choosing a particular element in each of those non-empty sets. And if you prefer, you can rephrase this in terms of products. So it says that if I have an infinite or infinite collection of non-empty sets, the product of those sets is not empty. And this is the mathematical notation for the product. This first letter should be a capital pi. It doesn't really look like that in the type set. But this is all the lists of uh, Elements where each of the i of coordinate comes from the i of set or collection. So, a, a way of rephrasing this choice function business is that the product of non empty sets is non empty, which seems like a fairly innocent assumption. So, you use the axiom of choice when you need to make infinitely many arbitrary choices. Because if, if you have a rule for choosing an element from each of your non empty families, then, then you don't need the, the, the axiom. It's only for when you don't have any technique by which to choose an element from each of your non-empty sets, then you have to invoke choice. And, and this is why it's non-constructive, because it's asserting the existence of this choice function or this element of the product, but it doesn't tell you how to construct it, how to find it, or really anything else about it. It just says that there is something. There is a function or there is something in the product, but you'll never know what it is. You can't know anything else about it, because if you knew more about it, you wouldn't have to invoke the axiom in the first place. So it says, something exists, but I can't tell you what it is. Uh, and then the example I always like to use is that the axiom of choice is needed to choose from an arbitrary collection of socks, but not of shoes. This is also not my own, but I, I couldn't find a quote. This is written all over the place. And this is because if you have an infinite collection of socks, you're making an arbitrary choice between the two socks. Because, uh, I don't know, at least my socks are not left-right socks. They're just socks. They're interchangeable. But shoes, you always have left and right shoes, if you know, you're like most of us, I think. And uh, you can always just choose the left shoe. 
you can always you can come up with a rule by which you choose a unique shoe from each of my infinitely many collections of shoes. So I'll just say I always choose the left shoe. So I, then I don't need the axiom of choice. If I want to choose a sock from an infinite number of pairs of socks, then I really need choice because my my decision is arbitrary. Is everybody with me so far? More or less. So when you say you're picking shoes from shoes, you mean you have a collection of sets of shoes? Yeah, I have, I have a bunch of pairs of shoes, infinitely many pairs of shoes. So each one of those shoes... I just shoes want to choose one of the shoes. ...would be an XI. One yeah, so, um, XI, so my, my capital XI here is every capital XI is a different pair of shoes. And then my, my little XIs in these parentheses, this is the mathematician's notation for lists of these tuples. The little XI is just one of the two shoes. And the choice, the excellent choice in the product formulation says that there is one of these lists. There, there is a list in which every element is either the right or left shoe from the i pair of shoes. And the same thing for sums. And if you prefer the choice function, then I have, uh, let's, I have some index set of shoes, call it i, and then my function takes one of the index, indices and it, it will give me back a shoe from that, the i pair. Okay. And your definition of choice function in this example is that you can pick the left shoe. Yeah, for example, uh, if I, I can give an explicit choice function for shoes, always choose the left shoe, or always choose the right shoe, or ultimately, whatever you want. The point is you can do it. But for socks, uh, unless you know more about the socks, like maybe one is a little more worn out than the other one, or one is, you know, has a fancier pattern or something, if they're truly identical socks, and you have no criteria by which to distinguish them, by which to choose one over the other, then you need the axiom of choice to say that I can take one from an infinitely long list of sums. So what if your, uh, list, uh, your, infinite, your set of collections of socks was finite? So say you have pairs of socks, but you only have 10 of them. Yeah, so if, you have, uh, if your, your family itself is finite, then you can, there, there are constructive ways of choosing them. You can just enumerate them. Say so you just write the whole list and always take the first one. Because if you have a, a given, given a particular pair, uh, I can just order them however I want. You know? If you give me two socks, I say, this is the first sock, this is the second sock, and if I only have finally many pairs, I do that with every pair, and I just choose one the, however I want. You, know? you, you just enumerate them and you choose them however you want. If you want, you just number each of the finally many socks, and you always choose the even sock, right? That works fine. But you can't do this with infinitely many pairs, I mean, this enumeration procedure would never end. But I can do it with countable numbers. Pairs of finite pairs of socks. Uh, yeah, you can't. Because I can enumerate those with natural numbers. I can always pick an even number. So say I have so I have pairs of socks. And I have count, countable many pairs of socks. I can enumerate them. Right. Uh, but how are you assigning the indices to the socks? Uh, and I can always take the even sock. But how do you assign the indices to the socks? Okay. I think the yes. answer the well yeah. there's some problem here obviously. I think if you've once you have the I think choosing the bijection is the problem here. You don't yeah. have the, well, that's what Stephen is saying. Okay, yeah. You have to assign the indice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, once you've done this, you you already have the choice function, right? So, yes. so I, I know this is subtle, I'm sorry, it's only gonna get more subtle for you. <laughs> this is why I'm asking all these questions. Yes, sir. I'm a little stuck on the definition yeah. of the excellent choice. Okay. Particularly Fi is an element of Xi, which means an Xi is a set of sets. Does that mean Fi is a set? Uh, so F is a function, and it takes an index, and it gives me back an element of the ith set. An element of the ith set. Yeah, so the big X is the ith set. Okay, does that mean that Xi is the ith set? Yes, X, a big Xi is the ith set, and F of I is my chosen element in that set. So there are big X's and little X's. Yes. Um, so if there's only one set in the collection, okay. then this simplifies to the statement that I can choose an element from the set. Sure, yeah. Like in this case, you don't need the axiom in this case. If you have a, a single non-empty set in your collection, yeah. you know it's non-empty. And what does it mean to be non-empty? It means it has at least one element. So yeah. you can just choose that element. You know, there's really nothing to be done. So you only so need the axiom of choice when you have an infinite collection so of um, non empty sets. Well, right. Finite or more. Even if yeah, every set is finite. Two. Okay, there sorry. Are infinitely many of now them, I get it. Now I get it. still need this. Yeah. Okay. Two. This is my definition. So, so it, this, this, it seems obvious that you'd be able to do this. It's and just some set of indices. In this okay. case, it would be i is equal to 1. <laughs> okay. We're in the sub talk. There you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go. 
I think his uh, I think question is <laughs> his question is good because it's uh, okay. Yeah, no, no, I mean, I'm uh, I'm very familiar with this mathematical notation. I'm not How dare you bring this mathematical notation? <laughs> okay, so I hope we're all satisfied. This the statement seems incredibly obvious. I think we can all agree that it's it's, it's at least plausible. Certainly. So what about sandals? Uh, sandals are, are they tend to left and right sandals are yeah, not. Right. Even yeah, if, if they're like flip flops, then they have like kind of my middle toe. Yeah. Okay. Do I need the axiom of choice if I if I have an infinite number of sets that are all of cardinality one? Uh, well, an infinite number of singletons. Then they're all can, not empty, yeah, but they're all exactly of cardinality one. Well, if you know they're all of cardinality one, then that's your choice function is just the unique element of the set. So right. So I probably don't yeah. need choice. Function. So as long as you have if it's your finite <laughs> sets of size at least two, <laughs> and then you have any of them, then this is when you need the axiom of choice. Okay. <laughs> It seems, like, it, it, it seems ridiculous if we have to split these hairs, right? If we're like, of course we can do this. Of course, there, there are lists, you know, you can just choose a list for each element from one of these index sets, right? No problem. We'll see all sorts of crazy things that happen. <coughs> so this, the proof uh, that you could, um, the, the proof of the well ordering theorem using the axiom of choice won this guy instant acclaim in a professorship at Göttingen where Hilbert was, the best mathematician of the day. Uh, but not everybody was comfortable with this axiom. Like, it seems more complicated than the other axioms, which say innocent things like, I have two sets, I can union the sets. No? So, what did he prove? He proved that, given this axiom of choice, every set can be well-ordered. Oh, There's thanks. always this successor Sorry. thing, right? Yeah, okay. So that there is some next decimal number after pi, whatever it is. I mean, you can't describe it because it's non-constructive, right? Yeah. But there is a way of doing it. And right. at the time, this was and such an important problem. And Cantor thought, you know, you can just do it. It's a law of thought. This, even this, uh, it turns out, of course, that the axiom of choice is entirely equivalent to the well ordering theorem, but we'll see. So, really, all he does is say, like, this is equivalent to this. So, if I assume it, then it's true. You know? So, he didn't, <laughs> didn't actually do anything, but at the time, people had no idea. <laughs> and this is still very impressive. It's not at all obvious that there's such a strong connection. I mean, today, undergraduates can prove that they're the same thing, but it's, it wasn't so easy back so, uh, yeah, as, as I hinted, a lot of people were not comfortable with this axiom. I have a whole bunch of fantastic quotes from authorities of the day, which I'll read. Uh, the expert choice has many elegant consequences, but that is an argument for its interest, its mathematical interest, not its truth. Potter also said, it ascribes to us abilities which I, for one, am not aware of possessing. This <laughs> is a really, really well-spoken guy. And, uh, it is dangerous to claim the existence of an object one cannot describe. Whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. Hijack slogan. Does anybody remember? Uh, oh, I didn't know Wittgenstein was constructivist. Yeah, yes, it's, okay. uh, it's from Wittgenstein. I don't know that, I'm not sure that if he was himself constructivist, I'm not aware of it. Okay. He's one of my, uh, my heroes, anyway. <laughs> and uh, Luzin, who is a, a more famous mathematician, said this nice quote For me, the proof of the theorem by means of Zanella's axiom is valuable only as an indication that it is useless to waste time on the exact proof of the falsity of the theorem in question. So he's saying, if you can prove something with the axiom of choice, then I know it can't be wrong. I mean, so I know I shouldn't spend time trying to prove the opposite of that, the, 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 the negation of that statement, but it was not at all satisfactory to him. So then there was only motivation for him to go and actually look for an honest to goodness constructive proof of that statement. So uh, two names, well, at least one name we've seen already, Russell, had much harsher criticism. He had some fantastic things to say. The apparent, the apparent evidence of the axiom tends to dissipate upon the influence of reflection. He went on to say, in the end, one ceases to understand what it means, which I think many of us can agree with. And finally, in my opinion, there is no reason whatsoever to believe the truth of the axiom. And Emile Borel had some other choice words. The concept seems to me to be entirely devoid of sense. And any argument where one supposes an arbitrary choice to be made an infinite number of times is outside the domain of mathematics. So shots fired. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of constructivists would agree with these things, even the really harsh words of Russell. So unfortunately for Russell and Borel, both of these guys had actually used the actual choice and just not realized it. Because it really is that subtle. <laughs> so uh, in addition to these guys, Rene Baer and Henri LeBaig, so the, anybody who's taken an undergraduate degree in mathematics, maybe you've heard of LeBaig measure or LeBaig integration, these are really big guys. They were all critics of the axiom of choice in the early 20th century, and they all used it and didn't even realize. So Russell used it to prove that every infinite set has a countable subset. Countable means it's the same size of infinity as the counting numbers. 
And Borel proved something called the hein borel theorem, that every closed and bounded interval of the real numbers is, well, we say compact. So this is, this is the topological condition. And they didn't have the notion, they didn't have the jargon of topology back in the day, but even then they realized that this is a very important condition. The technicalities are not terribly important, but it's a very famous theorem that every second year analysis student learns. It has its name attached to it, hein borel We'll see Hein again, too. And uh, of course, it uses the axiom of choice, and he just didn't realize it. Actually, this has been happening for a very long time. Uh, in 1821, Cauchy, Augustin Louis Cauchy, proved what we now realize is an instance of the intermediate value theorem. He used the axiom of choice way back in the day, like 100 years before uh, ZF set theory. But he could have avoided it if he just made more careful choices. So you need the axiom of choice, once again, when you're making an infinite number of arbitrary choices. And Cauchy did in his proof, but in this case, he could have always just said, make the smallest choice, because it was always uh, a finite list of things coming from these like finite lists of uh, natural numbers. He might have always just said, take the smallest one and he'd be fine, but he didn't. So technically, he did use the axiom of choice. And in this case, he could have got around it, right? He could have just made a careful particular choice, uh, but there are instances, old instances, where this was not the case. So this guy, Edward Hein, showed in 1872 that a function is continuous if only if it's sequentially continuous, what exactly that means is not terribly important. It's an important property of functions. Uh, nobody noticed that he used the axiom of choice until this Italian guy, Michel, uh, I guess Michel Cipolla, in 1913. But in this case, the use of choice is really essential here. This result actually fails without the axiom of choice. Uh, and interestingly, the, the Italian school were the only people who ever raised any red flags about uh, these arbitrary choices before Zermelo came along in 1904 and actually stated this result, this, this axiom. I'm allowed to make these arbitrary choices. People have been doing this since 1821. And the only people who complained was this Italian school, which included people like, like Piano, if you've heard of Piano arithmetic, or Beppo Levi, of Beppo Levi's theorem in uh, like it's measure theory, or most people were totally fine with these arbitrary choices, even you know, like people like Russell and Borel, until someone actually wrote down that you're allowed to do them all the time, and then that's when they threw up their hands. So, uh, I've skipped over about, well, a few years of history here. But there's 19 years between when Zermelo writes down this axiom, and this guy, Kurt Gardel, who proved amazing things, and probably you've heard his name before, he proved that it's consistent with the other axioms. So it's at least not contradictory. It doesn't contradict the other axioms of set theory, the basic results of set theory. And I say this seems to have satisfied most mathematicians, but by this time, the proponents of the axiom of choice had pretty much won. The people like the David Hilberts, who were huge fans of Cantor and Zermelo and Frankel, and they say things like, we will never be expelled from the paradise that Cantor has created for us. <laughs> These people really defeated the constructivists of the time. And, but at the, between 1905 and about 1908, there was furious debate about whether or not the axiom of choice should be allowed. And eventually, the pro-choice people won out. And then finally, Gödel shows that it's consistent, and this was kind of the last nail in the coffin. The holdouts were hoping to show that uh, you had some weird paradox if you allowed it, and now we know it doesn't happen. And then 40 years later, this guy, Paul Cohen, shows the negation is also consistent. So that's kind of weird. So this means that it's independent of the rest of set theory. So whether or not you believe in the axiom of choice is kind of a matter of taste. If you believe in it, that's great. If you don't believe in it, that's also great. You get different mathematics, but you can't be wrong. It's really you make a choice. But this, this result of Cohen's came far too late for the constructivists. Uh, back in 23, people had basically already decided that the axiom of choice was all right. Paul Cohen did a lot of other interesting stuff. He also showed that the continuum hypothesis is independent. That's that question about, is there an infinity between the natural numbers and the real numbers? Uh, so he showed that this question as well is independent, so it's also a matter of taste. Uh, do you think there should be an infinity between counting numbers and decimal numbers? Well, it's kind of up to you. You can believe either way, you won't be wrong. But Cohen had an interesting interpretation of his own results. He thought this was just a deficiency in our axioms and not in mathematics. And he said that his point of view was basically that one day we'll realize that the continuum hypothesis is obviously false, despite the fact that it's independent of ZFC. He thought, you know, we're just gonna, one day we'll come up with better axioms, or we'll realize one day we'll have some sort of mainline into the platonic truth of mathematics, and we'll realize that the continuum hypothesis is obviously false. 
I think the leading authority in the continuum hypothesis today is this guy, Hugh Wooden, and he would argue the exact opposite. He thinks that the continuum hypothesis is obviously true, but uh, he's changed his mind at least once. As, as a young man, he was one of these child prodigies. As a young man, he was arguing that there should be exactly one infinity between the natural numbers and the reals, and now he no longer thinks that there should be any. In any case, a slight delay. And I think that's the end of part one uh, on the history of these foundational issues. So at this point in history, people have more of, sorry, I have one question. So had uh, Cohen's had uh, Cohen's results been introduced, say, earlier on, how would that have impacted things? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So, uh, yeah, I think even by, even by the 19 teens, people had more or less come to terms with the axiom of choice because the results that were being proved with it were so elegant and important, and I think probably it would have come too late anyway. He uses a really novel technique called forcing that is still really the only technique to show that things are independent, and it's a very modern beast. It's something that no one could have imagined in the 20s. So, I mean, if, if that result had come before Gödel's result, that it's consistent, that the choice is consistent with the other axioms, then things might have turned out very differently. Uh, that would have been certainly ammunition in favor of the constructivists that we shouldn't be allowed to use it. But, I mean, this is some sort of weird historical accident. And the really weird thing is, in my field, I work in a field called functional analysis, which is sometimes said to have four cornerstones, one of which is the hahn bach theorem, which is directly an application of the axiom of choice. So like my entire my entire field would not exist were, were not for the axiom of choice. Uh, I tried to learn a bit about constructive functional analysis for the purposes of this talk, but I immediately became scared and confused, and I stopped. <laughs> uh, like for example, for the functional analysis in the audience, of which there are a few actually, uh, you cannot prove that the dual of little l one, sorry, the dual of l infinity, is not little l one. You cannot distinguish these things in constructive functional analysis. It's very upsetting. Anyway, I, I, I'd be more than happy to explain that later if there's any interest. <laughs>